assessment is really, really critical. So as, as you can see here, this is just an example of a piece that would be folded, uh, a simple one, um, a little, little four-pager. But the fold is always below the mailing address. And also notice, right, the address is parallel to the long dimension, so that's correct too. Um, but the fold is below the mailing address. Here are some examples of fold placement for letter-sized letter -sized folded self-mailers. Um, and these are good placements. So uh, on the, you know, to the right of the address there, that's called the lead edge. And the lead edge should always be closed. So that's where the fold has to go. If there are two folds on the vertical, then it's the lead edge and the back there um, as well, so both sides. Um, if it's below, or I mean if it's on the horizontal, it needs to either be if it's a single fold below the address. And if it's, um, you know, more than one fold, it's above and below. So the, the whole thing has to be, um, you know, closed that way. So very important. Here are two examples, uh, bad examples of fold placement for letter-sized folded self-mailers. So you can see the example on the left has the fold on the trail edge. And, you know, you would think, well, can't they just have the lead edge? Well, no, they can't. So um, it's a big, big problem. And then um, there's the fold along the top. So address in the wrong um, placement. It's, it's Interestingly, it's with the, you know, long dimension, but it's the fold is above rather than below. So here's our little nightmare scenario, cost of mindless errors. Folded self-mailers not prepared for automation. So, you know, what, what's, what's kind of interesting and why these kind of add up, um, you know, one to the other is that, okay, now we've got a folded self-mailer and you can do several things right, but if you do something wrong, you can kind of ruin everything. So you can see here, we're sized within letter mail standards. We're built to proper aspect ratio. Cool, rule number one, check. You know, our mailing address is parallel to the long dimension with adequate contrast, perfect. Essential number two, check. Now we're on essential number three. Fold on the vertical is at the trailing edge, not the lead edge, and the open lead edge is tabbed. There's our big problem, and here's what happens. We now become a non-machinable letter again, okay? We saw this similar example when we were a non-machinable letter because of aspect ratio, and we're back to an extra 500 bucks on 2,000, five grand on 20,000, and almost 25 grand on 100,000 pieces. So, um, and again, this is on a simple, you know, folded self-mailer with, you know, that doesn't have the fold on the lead edge. So think of these three critical things when you're dealing with um, letter mail, and think about, you know, aspect ratio, so proportion, address orientation, and if you're creating a folded piece, then fold placement, um, and it's always got to be on the lead edge or below the address. On a happier note, <laughs> let's look at format selection. So there are, there are so many different options, actually, for mail formats. It's kind of fun. Um, you know, I think sometimes we see a lot of the same thing and we may think that our, that our um, choices are quite limited, but it, it's, it's truly the opposite. There are so many things we can do. So sometimes it, it, if you really think about it, it can get a little bit confusing or overwhelming because there's so many choices. Um, last time in the, in the previous session, I, I touched upon what's called the full dress direct mail package. And it's considered the highest form of mail. And it's the kind of the multi-part mail package, right? It's got an outer envelope. It's got a direct mail letter. Oftentimes, it's called a lift letter, which is a little support letter. It's got a brochure, a reply card, sometimes a reply envelope, and possibly a freemium or something else inside. So these are these multi-part packages, and those packages work together as a sales team. And it's considered the highest form of mail, great for, not for everything, right, because it's multiple pieces, um, you know, they, they can be pretty expensive to put together, but if they're great for bigger commitments, right, if you're trying to get somebody to donate 150 bucks, if you're trying to get somebody to subscribe to, uh, you know, a continuity, you know, service or program, if you're trying to get them to, to buy something bigger, like those types of things, the bigger commitments where you need a lot of support material and information, these are great full dress direct mail package. 
envelope mailers, right? The, the, the protection of an envelope with a, usually a folded piece or a letter or a brochure inside. Um, it's definitely protective covering that you get the curiosity factor of what's in there. Um, of course, you have to think about getting it opened, and we talked a bit about that, and you'll, you'll also read a lot about that in your uh, Design Great Mail publication. Um, and it's also, you know, can be a requirement if it's a non-self-mailing piece or if the piece cannot mail without, technically, without the protection of an envelope. So um, sometimes it's a requirement, sometimes it's a decision. Folded self-mailers, or FSM, that's our kind of code uh, uh, acronym uh, with USPS. Uh, it's mail that, basically it's folded material that mails without the protection of an envelope and uh, can be really cost effective. Uh, it can have aesthetic issues because you do have to close the edges. We were talking about tabbing a little bit. Um, and I get into, by the way, in your, in your um, optimized format publication that you're getting, I give you all the requirements for tabbing and glue and stuff like that. Um, we're not going to get into the weeds on that today, but all of that, um, you know, and the, and the requirements guides and things are all in your publication that you're getting. So not to worry, I've got you covered. But, um, you know, there can be an aesthetic issue with tabs, right, because you have to tear them. And, you know, glue can be annoying um, and sticky and whatever as people are pulling it apart. So, you know, there are definitely some aesthetic issue with, issues with folded self-mailers, but you also get, you know, um, sometimes a kind of a wow factor and color and whatever, uh, you know, they can be very practical and efficient um, as well. So folded self-mailers. Um, and also, if you want to know about the USPS uh, FSM guidelines, um, they really haven't changed much since they came out in 2013, the new guide. And I have a, a video called the USPS 2013 FSM guidelines, a crash course. It's on YouTube. And it's like seven minutes. And I'll take you right through all the kind of top line stuff. And as I said, there's also a, um, uh, a quick guide in your publication that you're getting. Um, billboards and postcards. So it's kind of funny. A lot of, most people call anything that's a kind of a two-sided card format a postcard, but that's not the truth. Um, postcards are very specific uh, postal products uh, according to the USPS. They have a very specific size requirement and, uh, you know, and they get special rates because of that. So postcards are postcards. Anything larger than a postcard um, is considered a billboard. So, you know, and billboards mail as letters or flats. They're considered large card types of formats. They can be very effective, very cost effective and easy. And by the way, um, you can do some really nice things with simple card formats. There are so many nice, um, you know, digital techniques, variable data personalization, varnish techniques, UV coatings. You know, just because it's a, it's a simple mail format does not mean that you can't do anything creative with it. So, you know, just think about that. You're not that limited. Booklets and book logs. So booklets are USPS letter size found materials. So, you know, the little kind of booklet type things, multi-page, but it's their letter size. And book logs are little letter sized catalogs. It's kind of a term for letter sized catalogs. So booklets and book logs. I challenge you to use that today in a sentence. Um, catalogs and magalogs. So the, the difference is just these are multi-page bound materials, but they're USPS flat sized. So book, you know, the booklets for letter size, uh, catalogs and magalogs are flat sized bound materials. And magalogs are just a combination of a magazine and a catalog. So it's just kind of a neat uh, mail product. It's got more of an editorial type feel. They're fun to, you know, there's product placement in there and there's also editorial content. It's called a magalog. Periodicals are publications that get special mail rates. Uh, they have to be sent at least four times a year to an established list of subscribers. There's really uh, tough um, uh, requirements for being accepted for periodicals, and that's because they get special rates and, and better services and things. So um, there are some great kind of benefits of being a periodical, but you have to really meet the stringent requirements. Transactional mail and transpromo. Uh, transactional mail is your bills and invoices. And transpromo is marrying marketing content with transactional mail. So if you've ever opened a bill and it's got like, you know, a little uh, cross promotion full color ad on the side, that's because people uh, spend two to, on average, um, two to three minutes with transactional mail. 
So TransPromo is a really great opportunity to cross-sell and to get people's attention. It's not kind of like your classic uh, marketing mail where people spend that kind of three to five seconds at first and you have to try to catch their attention. Transactional mail is built in invoices. They're going to look at it um, and they're going to spend time with it. So TransPromo is a, a great opportunity. Marriage mailers, uh, we've probably all seen these. We maybe didn't know they were called marriage mailers, but it's just a shared mail opportunity. So you've probably seen things like Valpac, um, the money mailer, things like that. And so when a bunch of companies join together into one piece of mail and you pay about two to 12 cents per household for inclusion. And it's not necessarily just an envelope format with the little coupons in it. Um, I've got something uh, called a birthday pack. It was a brochure and eight different restaurants gave little coupon cards that were tipped on. So, I mean, it, marriage mail can be, you know, take many forms, but the most common I think that we've all seen is the envelope with the little coupons in it. Snap packs are those kind of official looking mail pieces with the, the tear off edges around the sides. Um, and so these are, you know, official looking, seem very confidential. Uh, people take them very seriously. They're not the most fun form of mail, but um, they can get uh, pretty, uh, pretty good um, results because people open them. They go, okay, this must be important. Newsletters and flyers are just very simple information delivery. These are, you know, your, your, your eight pages, your one page, you know, your two sided, you know, eight and a half, 11, things like that. They're often kind of desktop published or unsophisticated, very easy to produce and inexpensive. And then there's circulars, inserts, and wraps. And these are often mass produced um, types of promotions, generally retail, um, often on newsprint. And um, they can insert or wrap with other marketing content. Oftentimes they don't self-mail. They tend to be, uh, you know, inserted or, you know, wrapping a newspaper or wrapping a brochure or, you know, somehow a part of a, a broader kind of mail package. And so, you know, there, there's lots of different variations of how uh, these different mail pieces work. And then, of course, there's parcels and irregular parcels. So anything that's too large or rigid, to qualify, qualify as a flat um, is considered a parcel. And anything that's too oddly shaped for machine processing is considered an irregular parcel. So your mailing tubes and things like that, those are your irregular parcels. So you can always send a package. So classes, so depending on the class of mail, um, you know, that, you're, that you choose, um, you're gonna have different pricing, different levels of service, um, different requirements to meet, and also different delivery timelines. And I, I should have put like an asterisk, asterisk, highlight, underline on delivery timelines because I think, um, you know, when we're doing our own mail, I think we often kind of get so used to just dropping, you know, a single piece of mail, you know, first-class mail or something and saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm just mailing it from here to there. I mean, it'll be there tomorrow. And forgetting that, let's say, if you're sending it a, you know, a, a, a kind of a, bulk or standard mail type of a, um, you know, class of mail that it, it may not hit the mail stream for a couple of days, even if you send it, you know, and that there's a different longer timeline involved, um, that not all mail, just because of proximity, uh, mails on similar timelines. So um, it's really, really something to think about when you're planning for mail is to make sure you're building in the appropriate amount of time for the class of mail that you're sending. So there are several different classes of mail. Um, kind of the highest class uh, for USPS is Priority Mail and Priority Express. Um, kind of an interesting factoid, it's technically it's FedEx, um, and, which is kind of interesting. They have a, a deal with FedEx um, for this, but it travels by air, gets there within one to three days, depending on whether it's express, overnight, or priority. Um, most people, though, if they're mailing, aren't sending things by priority or priority express. The exception would be, let's say you have your, you know, your top 50 clients and you want to send them something that really wows them, a, a special kit in a box with multiple pieces and things like that. You know, you might do something like that as priority or priority express, but most of the time you're not going to be living in, in that um, class of mail for your mail campaign. So first class. Um, you have a choice of single piece first class or pre-sort. And if you choose pre-sort, you have to meet a 500 piece minimum to get that pre-sort um, discount, which can be up to about 20% discount, which is a nice discount. It gets there within one to three days. Um, so, so that's great. Um, the one thing to note on first class mail is, um, or any of these, you know, uh, 
anything where you want to get a special reduce, a reduction or discount is, for example, if you want to do something very personal, like a handwritten address and a first class stamp, you know, a special stamp or something in a handwritten address, that's not a standard address. So if you don't have standardized addresses, you can't qualify for um, the different kind of reduced rates in the pre-sorting and different classes of mail. So it's just something to, to think about. Um, now, it's not to say there's not a lot of value to handwriting the address. We kind of talked about that in the last session about that human touch and how people see that as significant or important um, and take notice, but it just, it becomes a choice then. You know, you trade one for the other. Um, standard mail is considered your marketing mail, uh, it's often called marketing mail, bulk mail, commercial mail, um, and that has a P, uh, 200 piece minimum or 50 pounds. So you can't just go and say, hey, I've got 100, you know, 50 pieces to mail. I want to, I want to send it standard mail. You know, you can't do that. You have to standard mail. The requirement is at least 200 pieces or 50 pounds. Um, and it has to be, you know, meet the requirements, standardized addressing, things like that. Um, and, but look at the timeline here. You're looking at three to nine days for delivery. And, um, you know, and even then there's like no guarantee that it's, you know, that of that range either. So, you know, you have to build in the time, but you get, you know, tremendous uh, break on, on cost, on, on postage. Periodicals, I mentioned, you have to really qualify for that. There's no kind of specific time frame on that, um, but you get a special rate and, you know, you have to build in time for it to arrive. And of course they have package services as well. Um, and that's two to nine days, so if you're sending um, packages. But one thing I wanted to talk about is um, the concept of deliberately spending more or less on your postage. So, you know, the, the one school of thought, of course, is why would you spend a dollar more than you have to on postage? Um, and that's an absolutely legitimate way of thinking, and I think about that most of the time. However, if you, Let's say you don't want tabs on your mailer, or let's say you want it to be large and, you know, a, a big square, you know, that's large and really stands out in the mail. So maybe you strategically make the decision to spend more, to send it as a flat, so that you don't have to tab it, because the, the requirements are different for flats than they are for letter mail. So, you know, I guess my, my biggest biggest um, point here is to say that make sure that every choice you make is deliberate. So mail and surprise should never be in the same sentence. It should never be a surprise that you're, you know, oops, I now have to pay more for my postage, or oops, I should have sized that down, or whatever. Um, you know, understand those rules so that when you decide to push them, you're doing it with intent rather than doing it by mistake. And there are really great strategic reasons to choose one or the other, but just make sure that it's always strategic um, rather than accidental. So let's look at mail planning a bit here. Um, and, and to get the best mailing rates, you have to have a standardized address. I, I just touched upon that when we were talking about classes of mail, that you know you cannot qualify for great mailing rates if your address, uh, if your if your list wasn't run through the CAS system and the change of address database. Okay, and the CAS system standardizes the address to the language and abbreviation system and everything that the and that USPS. Um, uh, wants for their system that their system can read. It also, you know, makes sure that the address is a real and legitimate mailing address. And then the national change of address um, system it, database is basically checking to see if that person that you're looking for still lives at that address. And so you need to run that frequently to make sure because people, people change and move, you know, there are millions and millions of, of moves every year. Um, and then you want to also design to USPS machine ability standards, which we talked about. We hit those essentials. Make sure you're hitting machine ability standards to process by machine. Um, a great tip as well is to ask your printer to apply or mailhouse to apply the intelligent mail barcode or the IMB. Okay? So that's a really important thing. Again, it's a work share thing for USPS. Um, so, you know, if you're already having your addresses inkjetted on, I mean, add the barcodes. It's a great, great thing. 
Um, have your mail pre-sorted, which I'm going to talk about pre-sorting in a moment, but that's sorting the mail in the proper order so that, again, you're sharing the work and you're delivering the mail in a way that makes it easier for USPS. And then the bonus is postal optimization strategies, which um, uh, I'm going to leave as a little mystery for now, and I'm going to hit those in a few minutes. But one of the things um, that, and I know uh, AccuZip can definitely back me up on this as well, but there are some really important things that you need to think about in digging deeper into your data. So, you know, last time, the last session, we talked about the list, the importance of the list, you know, how to get it, where to get it, how to segment it. Um, we got into kind of, you know, list hygiene and cleaning it and everything. But there are also data enhancement strategies that you can use that will also really help you get kind of closer and closer and closer to the perfect list. So there's something called apartment append. And what it's doing is um, it's adding the correct apartment number to the address. So if, if there's no address number on an address or if the address is the wrong address, it's never going to get the wrong address um, apartment number, I mean. Um, it's never going to get to the right person, or it may not, if there's no apartment number, it may not get delivered at all, okay? So that's just wasted money. That's money down the drain. So that's going to find and add and correct the apartment numbers. Deceased suppression, um, you know, kind of, this one's kind of obvious and a little bit depressing, but it is what it is, right? People die. Um, and so it's removing the deceased people from the list. And by the way, um, this is not only important from a financial standpoint and from a, you know, um, uh, this also, you know, when you send bad mail that either doesn't get to the right person or doesn't happen, it also messes with your response numbers because you think people have gotten mail and some haven't and it messes with your figures. But also in this scenario as well, if you're sending mail to households of people who have died, it can also make people feel it really badly. Um, you know, about receiving things for somebody who's no longer there. So, you know, from just a brand relationship and from a common courtesy, it's a very nice thing to do to run disease suppression. Um, ACOA is a, kind of a, a, an advanced or accelerated version of um, change of address, uh, enhanced change of address system. And basically it's going beyond the national change of address database to check other sources um, for changes of address. So there are millions and millions of people, I think it's like 40 million people, I don't remember what it is, I'd have to look it up, uh, people who move every year. But a lot of those people, uh, it's 45 million moves per year, 86 address changes every minute of every day through the year. There's my stat I'm looking for. Um, but anyway, a lot of people don't uh, file a change of address um, form with the USPS. Sometimes it's because, you know, maybe they're trying to be off the grid a little bit. Um, sometimes they forget, sometimes they're late, whatever. So the ACOA checks other sources to try to find um, those addresses for you and match them up. And then DSF-2 is a walk sequence processing. This is generally for saturation mail. We talked about saturation mail in the last session, but that's basically when you pick a geographic area and, you know, basically everybody within that area gets a piece of mail. So this tends to work really well for um, brick and mortar stores, uh, you know, political campaigns, things like that. But if you can, it, it, that the, the software or that program puts the mail into a walk sequence, so it's in the right order for the mail carrier. So again, you get special rates by doing that, by providing the mail in a walk sequence. So um, briefly, we talked a little bit about timing, so I'm going to skim over this, but your class of mail determines that timing. Um, and so does postal optimization, which we'll talk about in a minute, too, where you can find ways to cut that timing down. Um, and I'm going to show you some neat ways to do that. But otherwise, if you're just in a regular standard mail scenario, you know, there's a big difference between first class and standard mail, and you have to make sure that your timing of everything you do in your production builds in the time for the mail to arrive and to give per a person, a, you know, a chance to act on the mail. Nothing's more frustrating than when you get something in the mail and you're about ready to use it and the coupon code has already expired because it arrived late or something, or the event has already passed. So let's talk a little bit about mail sorting because this is a critical component to getting really good uh, rates. So, so mail enters the mail stream in three forms. In individual pieces, so that's when you kind of go drop a piece of mail in the, in the mailbox. Um, in pre-sorted letters um, that can be in trays or in mail sacks if they're flat. Um, and so those are sorted ahead of time. Um, and then also in pallets, 
of trays or house sacks. So the more, the further you go down that road, um, the greater your discounts end up being. So greater the work share, greater the discount. So mail is pre-sorted basically into four levels once it's been sorted by class of mail and physical characteristics. That's kind of the basic sort, right? They're not going to merge all the classes of mail together. Um, so they, they sort by class of mail, physical characteristics, and then they start pre-sorting by zip code. And so what they're doing is, you know, trying to find a critical mass of, of, um, of mail pieces that all are going to the exact same five-digit zip code. Um, and then, and, and I think the number is at least 150 pieces. And then after that, they look for, you know, critical mass of all the ma of mail pieces going to the first three digits of the zip code. Okay, so they're kind of kind of whittling down that zip code, starting with the five digit. That's our ideal. That's our best uh, optimal scenario. Then it goes to three digits, and then they it's basically. Um, what mail is going to all the zip codes supported by a certain area distribution center. There are 130 area distribution centers for USPS across the United States. So it's kind of saying, okay, this ADC supports all of these zip codes and these mail pieces are going to this ADC. And then after that, it's called mixed ADC and it's kind of everything that's left over, um, you know, and then that kind of gets sorted by where that's going to which uh, area distribution centers. So there's pre-sort software. Um, and uh, you're going to look for USPS PAVE certification. And PAVE means pre-sort accuracy validation and evaluation. It's a USPS program. And so you just want to make sure, you know, there's software for all this stuff. So, you know, look, if you're a, um, you know, a designer or a marketer or, you know, whatever, you don't have to sort this stuff yourself. I mean, software helps, your printer can help you or your mailhouse, um, you know, but it's just great to, to understand kind of how you can get those rates by really looking at where your mail's going um, and then starting to sort by zip code. Mail can also be sorted by carrier route or walk sequence. So I talked about um, that uh, uh, previously, the data enhancement of carrier walk sequence. It can also be done by carrier route. And again, these are primarily sorts for saturation mail. And again, you get a discount for helping them with this. So now let's talk about postal optimization, because let's say you, um, maybe you don't, like the, the, um, uh, the you know, the source, the, the, the pre-sorting is awesome if you send large volumes of mail or if you send large volumes of mail to concentrated geographic areas. But if you don't, if your mail's kind of spread out all over, you may not meet those minimum um, requirements for volume to meet those, uh, you know, 150 pieces to be able to start getting the discounts. So um, you can reduce your postage costs by an additional 5 to 7% on top of the savings you're already getting um, with pre-sorting. And you can increase the speed of delivery by using postal optimization methods. And there are three. They call them the three Cs. Um, commingling is the first one. And this is when you're combining basically dissimilar mail from other sources. So it could be your mail, a couple other people's mail, to get work-sharing discounts. So to, you know, let's say, you know, you've got a bunch of stuff going to five digit, uh, you know, to one zip code, and this other person does, and this other marketer does, but combined together, you guys meet the, the, the quantity that you need to get the work sharing discount. So it's called commingling. It can take a little longer because you're mixing from different sources. So make sure you're building in enough time for these types of postal optimization methods. Copalitization is, um, you're also, you're combining things, right? You're combining pre-sorted mail from different sources. So everybody's met their pre-sort, whatever, you're combining those, that mail onto a pallet, right? Remember I said the further you get down that, down that workflow, right? Now we're pulling together a pallet. Um, and if we can pull together a nice big pallet and drop ship it to a distribution center, we're getting, you know, a much better rate for, okay, we've done all of this work for them. It's all pre-sorted and brought it all onto a pallet and we've dropped it off at the distribution center for them. So we've made it a lot easier and you get rewarded for that. And consolidation is uh, kind of cool because you're basically bundling direct mail together that is destined for the same region and you're driving it to the near the post office that is nearest to the delivery destination. So you're basically saying we're dropping it to the local post office that's actually going to take it to its destination. 
and, and remember I was talking about how you can cut the time frame that way? Oh, and I was talking about standard mail, and I said, you know, you got three to nine days, you got to build in all this time. Um, consolidation is not only a benefit from a price standpoint, but it's also a benefit from a time standpoint. You're basically taking it into your own hands and cutting days off the delivery because you're driving it to the destination post office, okay? So that's the other advantage is you can kind of not cheat standard mail, but in essence, you kind of are, right? You're saying, cool, we're going to do standard mail, we're going to get the best rate, and we're going to drive it there so that it so that it cuts days off the normal delivery, um, you know, uh, timeline. So I've got three, um, three other data tricks for everybody to kind of tie things up, because I think these are really interesting. And again, I, I, I just want to reinforce how important your data is and your strategies around how you manage your postage and how you really think about the best ways to get your rates. So if you're not looking at your list strategically, you really are wasting money because, you know, postage can be up to 40% of your production cost. So, you know, if you, anything you can do to cut that down, cut that down, cut that down is going to really, really help you. So, you know, if you, it, unless you have a reason to deliberately spend more, I would say don't spend any more than you need to on postage. Trick number one is analyzing the list density. So I want you to look at your, your address list and to figure out where they are the most concentrated. So where are your lists, where are your addresses the most concentrated? And I want you to think about it. So if you're printing and producing in California, but if you're frequently mailing to Florida, could you produce the mail in Florida? It's just a question. It's a strategic one. It's a production question. If you can't print it in Florida, can you drive it to Florida? And the reason I ask is because can you save money by, again, cutting days off the process, cutting, you know, the either or shipping or whatever it is, but kind of thinking about the strategy behind, you know, are we producing this in the most efficient way and getting it to its destination in the most efficient way? It's called zone skipping or drop shipping. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I talked about that in the previous section of postal optimization. But if you can get the mail to its destination entry facility that serves the delivery point, like we talked about, you can truly, you can save 3.6 to 4.5 cents per piece on automation rates. $45 a thousand, $450 on $10,000, $4,500 on 100,000 pieces. And when you really, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot of money until you add it up. So these things can be really valuable. So to get it close to its, you know, destination, you're going to save postage and use time to your advantage, which is really valuable. You're also going to get pretty happy customers for doing so. And, um, you know, if you, look, you're not on your own on this stuff. Um, obviously, there's USPS mail acceptance staff. Um, you know, our friends at AccuZip are experts at this. Um, they can really help uh, guide you on all this stuff. So anyway, um, information on USPS entry location, and you can work with a logistics partner to move your mail uh, the best you can. So, you know, you're going to want to run a pre-sort analysis, look at those results, um, search for those regions of concentration, Five-digit zip qualifications are the best, um, but, you know, hey, three digits great too. You know, everything helps if you're helping and, and getting things down the, down the road there. And, um, you know, work on it as a business strategy. You know, crawl, walk, run on some of this stuff. I know this is a lot, but, you know, start to think of it as a strategy. Start to look at your list as strategic. Number two is householding. So, you know, why spend the money on sending everyone in a household or business a mail piece? Um, you know, it can be perceived as wasteful, um, and, you know, you're also spending that money on production and postage, so householding is a strategy. It kind of looks like a birdhouse more than a regular house, but I like that little picture. Um, so think of it this way, Sam Smith plus Mary Smith plus Tyler Smith equals the Smith family. So if you're in a B2B scenario, you know, you just want to get to the right people, and you might want to put your sales team on trying to whittle down to get to the best decision makers and the right people within an organization rather than kind of blanketing everybody. And number three is add a name. And this actually is my favorite tip because it's so obvious and yet I think counterintuitive sometimes. So if you've ever missed the minimum quantity requirements for standard mail, remember I was saying you have to have at least 200 pieces to qualify for standard mail. A lot of times people say, well, we don't have enough, we don't have enough addresses, so we'll just have to mail first class. 
add names to your list. It makes so much sense, but it's on the other hand, it just, it's, it's not obvious for some reason. So determine how many you need. So how far are you from the 200 piece minimum for standard mail? If you have 185 pieces, you're 15 names short. So your goal is to find 15 names. Think about this, you can say full first class postage rates on 185 pieces. And remember, in first class mail, you don't get an automation option until you hit 500 pieces minimum. So I mean, you're way away from that. You're not gonna get any discounts on first class. Um, so, okay, so let's do the math. 185 pieces at full rate first class is $90.65. 200 pieces at the standard rate, this would be your worst case scenario, basically, um, it, that you the most you would pay um, is $60.80. So on 200 pieces, you're saving 30 bucks, and 30 bucks is 30 bucks. So, and, and, and the funny part is, is finding names is really easy, right? You can pull names from other lists that you might have, add seed names from your company to test the mailer. I mean, why not? Add household, a few household names back in. Um, buy a few more names, uh, or ask your customer to work on this. Say, hey, we wanna save you some money. We need 15 more people, help us out. You know, we need to, we need to grow the list a little bit. So in conclusion, I just want everybody to remember that proper planning is really the key to our greatest efficiency. So you want your cleanest list possible, you want your most optimal format, and you wanna always be in the automation mode. Um, you wanna be machine processed, automated if possible, and you always wanna do as much of the work share as possible. And your homework, of course, you didn't think I'd let you get away with that homework, did you? Um, you're gonna dig deeper into your data and your mail strategy, looking at what we did today. I want you to reassess the mail you've sent. I want you to think about it, look at proportion, look at all sorts of things. Um, and you know what, if it's, if it's not within proportion, I want you to think about going back and reworking it, or if not, to do it deliberately. Um, you know, consider pre-sorting and barcoding services, consider some of the technologies that will help you uh, with those. And I want you to research one postal optimization strategy, that's your assignment. So our next uh, session in four weeks is on testing, tracking, and measurement, and it's the final component of the workflow of creating mail. So we're gonna talk about all different ways to test, we're gonna talk about how to, how to track and attribute um, you know, uh, success to a campaign and how to measure success and all the different ways you can measure success. So I'll see you on June 15th for part three. And in the meantime, youtube.com slash foldfactory, watchmanlinda.com. And I invite you, of course, to connect with me. I'm everywhere, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, you can't escape me. So just give in and connect with me. So um, with that said, uh, by the way, I do wanna call everyone's attention to the fact that the final webinar is at two o'clock Eastern. Um, but otherwise, I know we're kind of short on time, but I'd love to open up for questions or comments from Kristen or any last, um, last words or questions. Yeah, we did get a, a couple of questions here. Thanks, uh, Trish, okay. for covering so much information. It was just like, we're all done, thank you. Um, Maybe You're we'll welcome. take a couple questions. Yeah, uh, one is for um, for Accusate, but I'll ask this one for you. Sure. Um, it's will the USPS informed delivery offering? I should say that better. Will the USPS informed delivery offering change how marketing mail is designed? So will that change design with informed delivery? Um. You know, I, I think it, it just identifies letter mail, right? The informed delivery is, I think, just for letter mail. That's the new the new technology that tells you what's coming, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah I have new. not personally heard that it's changing the design, like how how mail is designed. However, I, I understand the question, um, and we may have to start thinking differently because people will start to look at their mail through their email and maybe make some decisions ahead of time on what they want to, you know, ignore or or not. Um, but I, I don't, at the moment, I'm not aware of anything. Um, however, I, I do think things could change. I think the technology and the adoption of it could change based on what human behavior, kind of what we see come out of using that technology. I think it's a little early. 
Correct. And just to expand on that a little bit, um, I am I am too not familiar with the, the physical dimensions changing with those requirements, but there are some changes in the mail.dat, the electronic file structure that gets uploaded to the post office. Um, and there's some mm. additional components that mailers can now include in that file, such as digital images and uh, pearls and, and URLs. So it will actually, when you get the piece via informed delivery, uh, there can be a, a colored image of what what is a preview of inside as well as a URL that you can click on. So the physical components of the mail piece, I have not heard of those dimensions um, requirements changing, but there are some some changes as far as the components of the, the back-end mail files that get uploaded to Postal One for the components that then get delivered to the recipient via their inbox and what they can see as far as the digital image goes that correlates to the physical piece that's then being resides in their mailbox that day for delivery. That's cool because that sounds like an opportunity there, you know, to get people to start Absolutely. to interact before they've even received the mail. I think that's pretty yes. interesting. You kind of have two chances, you know. And the open rate really for the the informed delivery um, has been been off the roof. So as far as the mm. email open rate, so it's still again very new um, and yep. and don't have a position one way or the other. But there are some some components to the digital file that gets uploaded to Postal One that mailers will want to account for if they're interested in taking advantage of that that technology. Awesome. And, uh, Great, uh, and maybe, uh, and that was for everyone, that was Kristen from uh, AccuZip uh, sharing that, that knowledge here with us. Uh, one, uh, one more question here, but also I just wanna do a quick reminder for everybody too, uh, we've, uh, the recording for the webinar will go out Friday, maybe Monday at the latest, but you'll get the recording. I'll let you know the PowerPoint slides, those are uh, proprietary, to proprietary to Fold Factory, so you won't get a copy of the slides, but you'll get the recording, so you'll have everything through the, recording as well, look for that in a day or two. And then let's let's take, we got one more question here for, uh, let's take one more for this, Chris, I think this one's maybe more for you because it's asking about AccuZip. So uh, I'll throw it your way and see how see what we got here. It says, are there uh, a separate modules on AccuZip 6 that can assist with deceased suppression and ACOA? And are the apartment appendants available through locatable address conversion is this a separate module too? So kind of asking about is there separate modules for? Sure, yeah, yes, well we, we call it our, our DES package. It's integrated into the AccuZip 6 product and it does all four of the services that Trish, Trish mentioned. It does the apartment append, the disease suppression, the ACOA, and the DSF. It does it all real time. You can choose one or all four. Uh, it's all the same price and it will upload your file, process it through those selected services, download it, and then update your database with that information and generate reports for it. So it's a pay-as-you-go. It's not a flat fee add-on module, but it is integrated into AccuZip, at the AccuZip 6 desktop product. Uh, we also have the option for the RESTful APIs and all of that, but it's an add-on service. It's a flat fee for all four services. Okay. So hopefully um, that answers the question. Yeah, very good, thank you. So Trish, I'll give you the last word here in a second, but just wanted to mention, thank you everyone for participating and joining the webinar here. We're really glad you did. I uh, really wanna thank our sponsor, uh, AccuZip, once again for sponsoring the webinar and sponsoring this entire series of the Direct Mail Simplified. As you can see, the next one's coming up on June 15th, so do register for that. And uh, with that, Trish, I will give you the last word uh, today All for right. our webinar. All right, excellent. Um, hey, it was great to, to spend time with everyone. I appreciate it. Do your homework, and I expect to see everyone on the 15th for mail tracking and measurement. Invite your friends. We're going to have a party. We're at the end of the workflow here, and uh, let's do this. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. It's a party, a party in June, yes. June 15th. <laughs> great. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Excellent. Bye. Okay. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Great job. Bye.